Hello and welcome to our sixth webinar in the Health Partnership Scheme HPS presentation series. This series, which started in January last year, provides health partnerships and others with the opportunity to share their experiences in a variety of health themes and topics. Today I focus on long-term volunteering and international placement contributions to health partnerships. You should be able to see our screen. Uh, you're all currently on mute, so we're not able to hear you. The recording of the session, along with the slides, will be available after today on our website and YouTube channel, in case you have any problems with connectivity or in seeing the slides. We'll have some time for questions at the end, but in the meantime, if you'd like to let us know of any problems with the audio, please let us know through the typed questions box. We will try to address the problem. I'm Graham Chisholm, Volunteer Engagement Manager at THET, and I'm joined by Sophie Pinder, an Evaluation and Learning Officer, also at THET. We're here to introduce today's presentations and hopefully ensure the technical side of things runs smoothly. Now, at the end of Health Partnership Scheme, HPS, and following discussions with Africa Health Placements, AHP, we thought it would be useful to reflect on the UK health workers' contributions as volunteers or as staff on international placements to health partnerships and projects in developing countries. Today, we'll be hearing from different experts and actors in the field of long-term volunteering generally meaning six months or more, but up for discussion perhaps, and international placements to understand how these volunteering and paid placements are beneficial to health partnership and global health work, including what the benefits and challenges are, what needs to be done, and what needs to be put in place before, during, and after placements to make these a successful experience for programs, health partnerships, and the volunteers themselves. I'd now like to begin by introducing to our first presenter for this session, Stacey Ann Pillay, Chief Innovation Officer at Africa Health Placements, AHP, who's based in Johannesburg. AHP is a South African-based social profit organization working to address extreme inequities and access to healthcare through HR solutions. AHP has placed and orientated over 3,900 health workers, mostly doctors, including from the UK, in South Africa and other developing countries over the past 10 years. You may remember that the AHP's presentation at last year's FET conference in London. I'd like now hand you to Stacey. Okay, Stacey, people should be able to hear you now. Thank you so much to the TET team for organizing this webinar and to all those who have joined to hear the story of long-term volunteer and contributions of international placements. Um, it's a great opportunity for AHP to share our story about our successes in terms of international long-term placements and also some of the lessons we have learned and where we see the role of health partnerships in long-term volunteering and international placements. As explained by Graham already, over the last 12 years, AHP has placed now over 4,200 healthcare workers that have provided over 33 million consultations to underserved populations, while strengthening primary healthcare initiatives and universal health coverage in South Africa. We have also placed in Malawi, Tanzania, and Kenya. At the same time, we've provided HR solutions in terms of workforce planning for over 500 facilities that has assisted in human resource planning and also the deployment of staff for the most impact. We have initiated retention saving activities and hosted over 700 capacity building sessions to 12,000 managers across South Africa. So now I'd like to share a specific example of a success story of a long-term international placement. The story of Dr. Korn, who was placed in South Africa through AHP. We were able to match his skills and interests to a placement in a deep rural facility in a community in the Eastern Cape, Isilimele Hospital. Daniel, who had graduated from a newer British university, not yet recognized by our medical council, was not able to be licensed at, at first. We did what we could to liaise with Dr. Korn and also work with his medical school 
and the regulator to obtain what was necessary for him to practice here. He then faced challenges when he arrived in South Africa due to lack of funding to employ him. But we worked with the ministry and Daniel to ensure he was appointed. During his 18-month placement, Dr. Korn provided outreach services to a small clinic after attending a conference and training with colleagues on pediatrics AIDS treatment, he led the clinic team to create a specific child and adolescent friendly clinic that would provide adequate HIV care for the needs of this community and ensure that it was provided in an appropriate environment. They even obtained a grant to do so. This was achieved in 10 months and almost two years after his placement is still being sustained. In Dr. Korn's words, he felt as a young and relatively inexperienced doctor, it had given him significant responsibility and provided an opportunity for him to try and make a small and lasting contribution. Dr. Korn, like many other long-term placements and volunteers, built long-lasting relationships with healthcare workers in surrounding hospitals, which created an environment for personal and professional support and allowed for attention. This story is one of the successes of long-term international placements. We see that many of the lessons learned are sourcing is important through alumni, targeted region sourcing and partnerships like Health Education's Global Health Exchange, understanding the skills that are needed and where they are needed the most to match doctors to a placement where they can gain valuable experience and give back. This is only achieved through good relationships with ministries and understanding regulatory processes for international placements and long-term volunteers to support doctors to make a difference where they are committed to help a low resource setting. In our experience over the last 12 years, some of the lessons we have learned and where we see the important, importance of partnerships are. There's a need to scale into Africa. HP knows how to find and bring doctors and hospitals along the placement journey. How partnerships that are built over many years with strong on the ground relationships can inform how and where long term placements are being made for the greatest impact. AHP is providing support to doctors to improve their clinical skills for the benefits of patients. Partnerships like the Global Health Exchange with Health Education England support better orientated and prepared placements. Doctors want to be recognized for their service and progress in their career. HP will provide an endorsement that allows for this, just as the Global Health Exchange endorses Global Health Fellows with a certificate. Doctors are agents of change in a system. HP will be providing technical and cultural um, orientation as well as social support and guidance for doctors to act as agents of change in the systems within the, which they work. Local health partnerships can provide key support to doctors on this journey. Thank you for your time. Our mission at AHP is to place and support doctors who want to serve in resource poor environments while simultaneously growing them professionally and personally. At this present time, we are having to turn away applicants who are interested in global health and working in a low resource setting due to lack of funding to support them and also lack of positions in developing nations. We would like to offer a global health experience to doctors that attract doctors to work in areas where their skills are needed the most. We look forward to collaborating with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stacey, for your presentation. It's been fascinating to hear more about AHP and particularly Dr. Korn's story. Lots of great lessons there, the ones I, I noted offhand, long-term nature of partnerships leading to greater impact, importance of placing clinically competent doctors, 
recognising the doctor's work in service to their careers. And of course, the power of placing doctors as agents of, of system change. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Robin Campbell, core medical trainee, junior doctor at NHS Lothian in Scotland, who completed her AHP placement at St. Patrick's Hospital in Eastern Cape, South Africa, from February 2015 to April 2016. I'll now hand you over to Robin. Hi there, thanks. I hope you can see my slides. Um, so my name is Robin Campbell. I'm a 28-year-old junior doctor and I live and work in Edinburgh in Scotland. I undertook my undergraduate training and foundation training here and I'm now a core medical trainee in the same region. However, before foundation and core training, along with my husband, who is also a medic, I undertook a diploma in tropical medicine in Liverpool and following this, spent 18 months living and working in South Africa. Since my undergraduate eight-week medical elective in Zambia, I knew I wanted more experience of practicing medicine in a low-resource context. And early in my training, I met other doctors who had worked abroad in rural South Africa, facilitated by Africa Health Placements. Overall, the experience was of huge benefit to me. After applying, 11 months of somewhat arduous paperwork began and my administrative and communication skills were honed significantly. Although the process to become employed and registered in South Africa was challenging, it was made much easier through Africa Health Placements, who smoothed out many bumps in the road on our behalf and advocated for us to different agencies and regulatory bodies while we remained in the UK. We certainly wouldn't have made it there without them. Once there, we enjoyed our 15 months working in a 180 bed rural district general hospital in the Eastern Cape as medical officers, splitting our time between medical wards, casualty, outpatient department and covering everything out of hours. Particularly challenging and exciting was exposure to specialties that junior doctors in the UK would have relatively low levels of responsibility in like obstetrics, anaesthesia and trauma. So my leadership and management skills are better as a result of my time there. I was in charge of the on-call rota during my time in South Africa, not straightforward when staffing levels were often half of what was ideal. And those months certainly improved my negotiation skills and resourcefulness. At home, I'm now more comfortable making decisions and leading more junior members of the teams I'm in. There was a lot of opportunity for service development and improvements in service delivery. My communication and teamwork skills have improved. Learning to work and build friendships cross-culturally was an enjoyable challenge and I've become more adaptable. The opportunity to learn a new language was not something we were very good at, but something we enjoyed trying. There were ample opportunities to further clinical skills. The sheer volume of clinical activity was greater. Exposure to conditions, particularly HIV and TB, including seeing advanced and unusual presentations of these, was interesting and useful. I've had a chance to assess, treat and perform procedures for a real volume and variety of clinical conditions that peers at the same stage in the UK will not have had. My assessment of acutely unwell patients improved and my enjoyment in actually practicing medicine increased. There were lots of opportunities for development of education, training and research skills and I was able to supervise undergraduate medical electives and I enjoyed teaching medical students in tutorials and at the bedside and this was certainly a highlight. My problem solving skills improved through solving challenging patient transport situations or from devising unconventional but effective new ways of doing procedures with limited resources, I have brought a more flexible and innovative attitude home. My own personal resilience, satisfaction and interest increased. You certainly become a bit tougher after a Christmas day in a South African a &E. 
being involved in patient journeys at every stage from the outpatient setting through admission to discharge is usually very rewarding and not something you can often experience in the UK. Assessing, investigating for and diagnosing something like TB meningitis, treating as best you can with what you have and then watching someone be discharged home well is among the most satisfying experiences. Having been back in the UK for almost a year now, not a day goes by that we don't think of our friends and our jobs in South Africa. The benefits from our time there certainly have had a lasting effect and it's been great for this opportunity to reflect on all we gained from that time. I do recognise what we gave too. We filled gaps in an extremely short rota, serving one of the most deprived communities in the most deprived province of South Africa. But overall, we hugely benefited from our time there. I was pleased to read the new Scottish policy report this week entitled Global Citizenship in the Scottish Health Service, produced by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, and hope that this also contributes to a greater understanding of the benefits of volunteering and working abroad in international development to the individual like me, but also to the wide, wider health service, particularly in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Robin, for that powerful first-hand account of your experiences in, in rural South Africa. Uh, lots of great lessons there um, from you know, sort of developing your leadership and management skills, communications, teamwork, clinical, academic skills, problem solving, and, and personal resilience. And, and fantastic to hear about global citizenship, which is, uh, is warmly welcomed, I think, by, by everyone, uh, and, and talks well to the, the Department of Health in, in, in England, uh, engaging in global health um, some guidance as well. Now, our next presenter is Professor Bill Irish, postgraduate dean for the East of England at Health Education England, is based in Cambridge. Bill has been supporting the work of the Global Health Exchange Programme, which was established and is sponsored by Health Education England, to support uh, the improved quality of the NHS workforce through global learning and exchanges. And as a result, building health education capacity in low and middle income countries. Global Health Exchange, or GHE, has been collaborating with Africa Health Placements, AHP, for a number of years. I'm going to hand over to Bill for his presentation. Hi Bill, we can't seem to hear you. Oh, the microphone has gone down. Should we go with somebody else? Uh, yes, I guess. Okay, um... Bill, we should be able to hear you now. Good, thank you very much. I say some of this is a slight problem with the audio at my end, but I will I will plow on. Um, I would like just to talk to you about our experiences in the English NHS of trying to systemise the uh, placements of uh, some of our junior trainees into uh, challenging environments such as South Africa in our partnership with Africa Health Placements. Um, this kind of emerged as uh, a project which I took on with my colleague Dr. Robin Weil um, to really supporting doctors who wanted to spend a short period of time uh, working abroad on a peripatetic basis. Um, we thought this was a good idea to see if we could make this into a national uh, program and something which was a bit more systematic rather than just relying on individual doctors initiative. We we're very aware of doctors leaving abroad, leaving to work abroad, what we called F3, at the end of their foundation training and we thought that if we combine that with a uh, opportunity to be, remain in speciality training then we might find that that was something which was helpful for recruitment into the NHS. So what we do offer is a global health program which offers a combined route to a specialist qualification, a certificate of completion of training in something like general practice, emergency medicine, anesthesia, etc. together with the opportunity to work in global health. 
Um, the main attraction, one of the attractions for us is to be able to offer a reasonably compatible salary with the UK, um, which we can do in South Africa, and that's one of the reasons which allows us to take tens of doctors into this initiative rather than the odd one or two. We've had some interesting challenges with marketing and trying to get the message out there to junior doctors and we've used a variety of social media opportunities to do that. We started with general practice and we're now moving to acute care common stem which is the route into, into emergency medicine, anaesthesia and acute medicine and we're also dipping our toes in the water with paediatrics uh, and as with Robin, uh, core medicine. Um, what we've learned is these programs aren't for everyone uh, and also there's a, a tension I think in terms of the duration of the placement. We've been working very hard about uh, getting placements for up to about a year um, where we feel as opposed to contributing seems to be in balance um, but that has been quite a, quite a, quite a challenge for us. I'll try and change the screen. So those, as I said, we're offering other specialities. And so we're an integrated program where um, our trainees do a hospital post in ST1. In ST2, they do a hospital post and general practice for six months each. And, and then we place them uh, in a rural African hospital, most of which are in South Africa. And then they return back to complete their training in general practice in our third year. Um, alongside that program, we we have some global health specific program which we have a series of seminars and workshops, um, some engaged P in terms of gaining registration in South Africa uh, and alongside that also the requirements of their speciality training program in the UK. So the issues for us over that have been designing which hospital posts are most appropriate to uh, working in that third year in Africa. Uh, Pediatrics, obstetrics seems helpful but not necessarily essential because the experience is so different. Um, we have a lot of trainees who do change their life plans over the preceding two years and we do have a quite a high level of dropouts and we need to factor that into our recruitment strategies. Providing adequate mentoring from a doctor who's experienced and supportive of the, uh, of the placements, uh, preparing them for deployment and uh, that's uh, you know, something we work at quite hard so that people can hit the ground running. Keeping them in touch um, through their placements in, in, in South Africa and um, AHP and Robin have worked very hard to maintain that sort of personal link. And returning back to the UK, debriefing, um, I'd also include occupational health issues uh, and also picking up the UK. But I think we've lost the uh, audio again. Psychological problems. In that they're people not, see sorry, things in Africa which they're not necessarily used to dealing with in the experience of them and who admit. Bill, your, your audio keeps, um, I don't know if you can hear me, your audio keeps going, so we're only catching up. And I think doctors who have spent seven to eight, and that feeling out into uh, South Africa or into an, uh, another. country which is very different from the experience that they sometimes get in the country. Uh, hello everyone, my apologies for the uh, difficulties with the uh, the audio uh, for, for Professor Bill Iris's presentation. Um, I think Bill was about to conclude. Uh, we, we've lost him, I'm afraid. Um, we do have his slides uh, there, and uh, 
um, which does sum up uh, the wins, and not only the personal wins in terms of volunteering, but those, those system wins for, for the NHS and the UK health system, as well as, of course, most importantly, the host country. Um, apologies, Bill, uh, and apologies, listeners, for, for the technical uh, difficulties. Um, I think in, in the interest of expediency, we'll now move on to our next presenter, Professor Louise Ackers, Chair in Global Social Justice in the School of Nursing, Midwifery, Social Work and Social Sciences at the University of Salford. Louise has been coordinating uh, the HPS-funded Sustainable Volunteering Project, which has deployed over 50 long-term volunteers to Uganda. She's also currently coordinating a project funded by Health Education Northwest, focused on understanding the returns to the NHS on international placements. She's conducted and published extensive research into volunteering. I'd like to hand you now to Professor Louise Hackers. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes, we can, Louise. Okay, okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, you asked me to speak about what makes long-term volunteering a success, so I, I wasn't going to speak specifically about our, our own volunteering programme, but just pull out some ingredients of what we feel makes long-term volunteering a success. In the slides, there's a couple of slides which really critique the very notion of the concept of volunteer, which I don't think really captures the kind, kind of activity that these people are involved in, and I've conceptualised them really as knowledge brokers in a knowledge exchange process. And I think as Bill talked about them as fellows, I, I would refer to them now more as international colleagues than uh, volunteers. Second point I make in my slides is um, to critique the notion of long term, Graham, and you mentioned at the beginning that you define that as six months or over. As you know, this is something that um, I've been very interested in, done quite a bit of work on, and I don't feel that length of stay in itself is a key ingredient of success, um, but that's something we can discuss later. And in the next slide, I consider what the dimensions of success are, what we should be looking for in terms of working out if long-term volunteering is a success or not, and I think we need to balance four beneficiaries. Oh, I'm not moving my slides on, am I? Right. Um, first of all, the personal goals of the individual concerned, um, who are volunteers to varying degrees. Um, secondly, the health partnership organisation that they engage with, which I think is very important, the organisational context and what their objectives are. Thirdly, the hosting health or education system. And I think in our work, we've taken a, a, put a real emphasis on the do no harm principle there. And in many ways, although I've listed that third, I would say that's the, the most important um, criteria. And finally, the health of education system to which the um, international faculty return. And so our ultimate concern really is with health systems change in the low resource setting. And the target really in capacity building projects such as ours is the health system and not the individual patient. And one thing we've taken a lot of trouble to try and um, emphasize is that there may be tension between serving the needs of immediate patients that, that come in front of our, our volunteers or fellows and the systems, and that sometimes we have to um, develop policies which balance the, the, the value of um, treating individual patients directly and also promoting long-term sustainable impact. And sometimes um, focusing on the individual patient can actually cause uh, systems damage. So in that context, I've tried to identify what we think are some of the key ingredients of a successful volunteering program for all those four parties. First of all, I think this comes out very strongly in all our work, whether it's with very experienced um, doctors, midwives, nurses, engineers, or with students. Um, there is a, there's a pressing need really for humility on the part of those that engage in this process and a willingness to learn. And I've put here about global health because I don't think clinical learning is necessarily all, always the most important. Um, so we need people to be open to becoming systems thinkers and learning about global health and not just about their clinical specialism. I think as the first speaker emphasised, for me the whole uh, this is all underpinned really by the quality of relationships that underpin those partnerships. And it's the continuity or robustness of the partnership, not the length of stay of any individual actor, that, that is the most important factor. 
I think what we've found is that multi-professional working, and there's been quite an emphasis today so far on doctors, but for us, multi-professional working, intergenerational working involving um, more senior colleagues and junior colleagues and students, um, and international working is what will be successful, not what I've called here ninja medicine, which is one of what RF2 described his, uh, his work in Uganda. I think it's very important that there's a mutual understanding and ongoing negotiation of objectives and roles, um, a kind of role description really that needs to be set out at the start but will inevitably change through negotiation. Uh, proactive communication and management in a responsive structure, which does imply that you have structures in place and you also have people in place in those structures, both at uh, home in the UK and in the low resource setting. Co-presence, 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 which Graham's very used to. It's a principle that underpins everything we do in Uganda and it really is, an, is really trying to prevent labour substitution or gap filling or the tendency of many volunteers to want to run in and be international peripatetic um, doctors or midwives. And we feel that that has a systems damaging impact and we must always be working in co-presence with our colleagues in Uganda or no one is learning on either side. Obviously this needs to be underpinned by risk management and um, intense support systems in both locations. And really an under understanding of knowledge mobilization processes and behavior change. And for me this involves a healthy skepticism really about fly-in, fly-out training interventions. I think a point that Robin emphasized, um, the value of on-the-job mentoring or, or bedside mentoring. Um, and finally, um, pol a policy on and policy adherence to all, all aspects of donations this might seem like um, not a very relevant point, but it affects everything we do and it affects our relationships with, with um, health professionals in Uganda. Um, if people are either giving money or equipment, um, it can turn us into what was once called a doctor donor in relation to one of our volunteers. So we try to keep a really tight hold on all aspects of donation so that we are behaving as international faculty and not um, not ending up in a kind of donor recipient model. So those are just some of my thoughts on what makes volunteering successful. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Louise, for, for, for your presentation. Lots of great food for thought there, uh, and uh, for perhaps for the Q and A section in, in a moment or two. All right, the nature of volunteering, you know, why long term? Um, also, you know, what success looks like and the, the balancing of those four beneficiaries, individual, partnership, critically hosting health system, but also returning health system, and, and a, a long, fascinating list of key ingredients of success from the individual, that, that humility uh, of volunteers, but also the, the, the bigger concepts around co-presence as well. Uh, I'm now pleased to introduce our last presenter, Peter Nash. Global Child Health Projects Manager at the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. Uh, Peter manages Global Links programs, which places pediatricians as volunteers for six months and more in developing country health institutions. Peter also coordinates a number of child health training programs. I want to hand over to Peter. Great. So thanks for that, Graham, and hello, everybody. Uh, so as Graham said, I'm based in London at the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, and I'm going to just tell you about our long-term volunteering program that we've been running for about the past five years. We recruit pedi uh, pediatricians from the UK, so members of my um, uh, members of our college. Hold on, I'm just going to do something on the screen. Um, I hope you can now see the uh, presentation I've put up. Um, so yeah, we recruit pediatricians from the UK um, and we place them in, the, in our uh, partner hospitals overseas in, in low resource settings. Past five years or so, we've had programs in Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Myanmar and Sierra Leone. The way 
this tends to work is that our main partners are the national pediatric associations in the countries where we work, so our equivalent professional body overseas, and they select the hospitals uh, who we uh, work with in, in coordination with the uh, local governments and the, and the national governments. So this slide, <coughs> this slide here, um, shows a little bit about the uh, volunteer program management cycle that uh, we we use. I won't spend too much time on this, but um, just to say our, our minimum placement length is, for each volunteer at least is, is six months, but it's usually 12 months or even longer, and then often the placements are sequential, so we'll have one volunteer followed by another at, at the partner hospitals. Um, so we are quite lucky that we have direct access to all of our membership, uh, so all the paediatricians in the UK, so we have quite a steady flow of paediatricians joining our program. We have a, a minimum level of experience of, we, we ask everybody to have full membership of RCPCH, so that's um, at least three years of postgraduate training um, in paediatrics. And this slide here um, is, I mean, our, our volunteers, I think, in the, in the hospitals where they work, they do tend to have um, a positive impact in the hospitals. This was taken from uh, January 14 to December 15, um, and uh, I think it, it, it gives an indication that the the individual paediatricians working at the hospitals, you know, they do have they do have an impact on on children's health where they work. But I think what we've learned over the past five years or so is that we wanted to make our programs a bit more um, strategic and 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 cohesive. Um, and we realised that having this sort of more strategic approach across the hospitals where we work. Um, was a better use of time and effort and money. So instead of just placing pediatricians at the individual hospitals um, and allowing them to work with the local staff to 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 address the the issues, we wanted to we wanted to try and um, as I say make it a bit more cohesive. And what we have adopted nearly all of our placements now is is an approach. Um, we we rely on uh, something called ETAT Plus, which is a is a five day training course that the volunteers um, they get trained in before they go, and then they get involved with doing uh, ETAT training whilst they're overseas. And really, it's about trying to teach the local staff uh, to recognise the sickest children as they arrive at the hospitals, those with emergency signs and priority signs, and then giving them some training in 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 what the um, uh, relevant treatment. So it's a five-day course, but really, you know, we found that most learning occurs after the course, where the local staff are supported by the volunteers to to implement the new treatments and techniques that they've um, that they've learnt during the course. The course by itself is very good, but it doesn't necessarily always lead to behaviour change when they get back into the hospital and that's really where the mentoring and support and the longer term um, support really really helps to, to change practice. Um, so we have, this is, uh, we're currently working in, in Sierra Leone and um, in beginning of 2017 um, we've moved to a national program of trying to implement ETAT at all of the government hospitals throughout Sierra Leone. So currently there are, let's see, there's 15 um, paediatricians out in Sierra Leone um, working at all the government hospitals there and they've been paired with a, a local nurse who has had the ETAT training themselves um, and they're now working with the with the local staff at each of those district hospitals. Um, the ETAT the CTAP methodology has been adopted by the Ministry of Health now, um, and it's something that they want to continue. Our our main partner is the Ministry of Health and the World Health Organization out in Sierra Leone. Um, so our current program, as it is at the moment, is until 2017. But then we're working on a 
program now where, so from 2018, 2019, the external support that we're providing is really beginning to taper down and being taken on by the national uh, local staff. So that's really, a, in a nutshell, our what our, what our programs do and have been doing for the past five years. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter, for your presentation. Um, challenging yourself, you know, do we do any good? Um, and, and I think addressing that, that, that challenge, uh, highlighting the, you're, you're going to scale in, in, in Sierra Leone uh, and your detailed explanation of ETAP Plus. Um, I'd now like to say a couple of words around FET partnerships. Uh, principles of partnership. Um, you know, we've heard some some excellent examples today of contributions of volunteering UK staff, you know, medical, non-medical, and placements in developing countries. You know, much of this work fulfills what we consider at FET to be the, the principles uh, of partnership. More informally, POPs. I'm sure most of you involved in health partnerships will be familiar with with the eight uh, principles uh, up on this slide, and of course available for you to explore on our, our website. Um, We've recently developed a partnership health check uh, to enable partnerships to, to measure themselves against the range of hallmarks of good practice out in the principles. The two aspects to the partnership health check, self-assessment followed by a partnership action plan. The purpose of completing the self-assessment will be to identify areas in which partnerships need strengthening. The results from the self-assessment will form the basis of partnership action plans that will tease out how partnerships can improve performance against specific hallmarks. So the rationale behind this whole approach is, is to provide partnerships with stronger foundations, if you like, to, to bid for future funding, plan future projects, ultimately increase the effectiveness uh, of your approach. And we, of course, encourage you to, to complete the tool uh, with your partners. Uh, and I think we've got the link uh, to the uh, health check on the, on the screen there. So I'd, I'd now like to hand you over to uh, Sophie Pinder uh, for to introduce the, the Q&A uh, session. Thanks, Graham. Um, so for the remainder of the time, uh, I'm conscious we've gone a bit over because we uh, had a little technical issue at the beginning. Um, so we've got about 15 minutes, uh, which is an opportunity for um, our online audience to ask any questions um, to the um, presenters. Um, so you have two ways of asking questions. Um, if you have a microphone, you can, um, what we call, put your hands up, which is basically using the little yellow hand button that you should have on your GoToWebinar um, control panel. Uh, if you click on it, we should, I should be able to see that, and um, I will unmute you and then invite you to speak um, uh, directly. Um, alternatively, you can type the question, your question, in the um, little question box that is also part of your control panel. And I can see we have already have some questions. Um, that's it, really. So um, I will have a look at the questions that we've got at the moment. And um, just unmute uh, all the presenters now. All right. All right, I'm just having a moment. Okay, so presenters, you're all on unmuted, so just be mindful of that one. No, no, I think you might have provoked a, a sensible outcome from this, actually. Mm -hmm. Right, sorry, I've had to unmute someone who was speaking in the background. Okay. Okay. Right. So we have a, a question from uh, Zainab who says, "How can we find information on um, that volunteer placement scheme with a view to um, enrolment?" Um, so I'm not entirely sure which volunteering screen, um, scheme that they're talking about, but maybe. Um, Pete, um, if someone wants to volunteer f um, through Global Links, how would they go about doing 
applying and finding out more information? So, uh, yeah, with, with ours, there's an application on our uh, website which you complete and send in with a CV. But really, the um, the important thing we like to, you know have a bit of a discussion with the potential volunteers before they sign up so that they've got an idea of what it is that we're asking of them. I think um, uh, all of these volunteer programs are so much about meeting expectations and as long as as long as the volunteers and the program managers and the volunteer and the partners overseas have the same expectations of what of what's required, then that will lead to a good placement. Um, but yeah, simply the way to the way to get involved is go to the RCPCH website and to um, download the application and, and send it in. Okay, great, thanks, Pete. Um, and what about the uh, Africa Health Placement Scheme, Stacey? Sure, Sophie. So anyone interested in a placement through AHP in Africa can um, go onto our website and start a conversation with us over email or call us directly. Um, just like Pete and I said, we're very interested in matching the needs of our placements to underserved areas. So it all starts with a conversation. Uh, and Louise? Um how would people go about getting in touch, getting involved in, in some of the program? Yeah, I think exactly the same. Go to the website or email me and I'm really pleased to hear what the others have said. It all starts with a conversation and then we link you up to existing or previous volunteers. Great, thank you Louise. Hi everyone, uh, Graham here again. I just thought it'd be nice just to maybe um, get a reaction of the panelists to this this issue, or, or perhaps not an issue, but around long term versus short term. Is it a red herring? Discuss. So you know um, who, who's on? Is, is is Bill, or perhaps we can start with uh, Stacey. Sure. Um, so in our experience. Um, the the long term, as you said, is difficult to define. So, Dr. Nash and also Louise Ackers alluded to the fact that if there's some kind of continuity in terms of people coming out and being replaced by other people, um, that really benefits the health system and system change. Uh, what we find through our experience. Sorry, what we found through our experience is that also for the healthcare worker themselves, they need about at least three months to acclimatize to a new social, cultural, and clinical environment before they can really start making any difference in terms of patient outcomes or gaining relevant skills. And so there is a point where um, people do need to integrate into the system in order to be giving back and making an impact and also to get the best benefit out of their placement. In South Africa, most of our international placements are paid placements. So there's a bit of labor regulations around that that requires at least a one year commitment. Um, but in my mind, um, uh, six months is a good yardstick, but there's a lot of other variables around continuity of placements, people coming out, and that sort of thing. And and the other panelists' uh, views. So just to just to echo what 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 Stacy said, I think um, we we ask for people to commit for at least six months um, because, yeah, there is a period of acclimatization, but also the volunteers need to build those relationships with the staff that they're working with, um, and that that takes a bit of time. Um, so, yeah, I'm interested to hear what Louise, what Louise has to say. Okay. Do you want me to chip in? <laughs> yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, as a geographer traditionally who, who's researched mobility, I don't think there's anything essential about length of stay. 
I think what we've, we've found is it's, a, it's really about the anchoring effects of project continuity and it's good to have some, some people there that are staying for longer. We have, um, we have some people at the moment that are there for three years doing PhDs and that helps then to organise. If somebody wanted to go for two weeks, I could probably organise now as we've got a clear project strategy, I could probably slot them into something very interesting which would support our overall activity. So I think it, length of stay in itself isn't a major factor. I think the relationship building is about the project. Um, we also work in multi-professional clusters, so we're not sending isolated volunteers out. I think if we were, I would, I would make a very different case. I would not send somebody for two weeks to a random place. I think that there's important equality aspects and equality of opportunity aspects to insisting on six months because we know from our experience that that disadvantages certain cadres of staff and people who either don't have the resource or have family responsibilities um, who are unable to go for more than six months and it would really prioritise and privilege doctors if, if we made that rule. We've been very successful in recruiting midwives who we feel make the biggest impact actually in Uganda um, and many of them are not in a position to stay for, for six months or over. And then I would just add um, we have an electives program for, for, for students and they go for one month and within, a, within an organised program we, we're absolutely sure that they're making the major health systems change as a, an overall project. Um, as a result of the undergraduate placements we've now set up um, a cervical cancer see and treat service in Uganda that would never have happened and those students only stayed a month but it's part of a project. And then one final cautionary word. I mentioned co-presence, co-presence, co-presence. What we found with our long-term volunteers that the longer they stay, the harder it is for them not to engage in labour substitution. It becomes a growing expectation if they're there for over a year um, that they will just become one of the faculty um, or one of the clinical people in, in that health facility and then local staff will, will take the opportunity to not present for work. So I think if people stay a long time um, there is a much higher risk that they'll get involved in labour substitution, which I think has a massively damaging impact on health systems. Thank you, Louise. G great insights uh, from the panellists. Um, so clearly there's no simple answer, long-term, short-term, anchored in, in uh, long-term partnerships and relationships, perhaps. I'm going to hand over to Sophie. We've got questions coming in thick and fast. Right, so we, we have a, a question from uh, Kerry Jones who asks, um, has anyone had any contact with the African Platform on Human Resource for Health or other regional arms of the Global Health Workforce Network? Um, and she says that there are some very interesting issues to learn from this forum and it would seem appropriate for any schemes um, that are at scale to sense check at this level. Well, I don't know if you want us to respond to that. I've never heard of it, but it would be useful to have information on it. Okay. Right. Well, um, I'll, what I'll do is I'll share the, the question in writing to you with the, with the name of the, the, the platform and the, and the network okay. that James mentions. Um, okay. Sorry, anyone... sorry. Yes, Stacey? I'm not sure about the specific platform, but we have been involved with the World Health Organization's um, Global Workforce Forum. Um, and that's where I will be next week talking at a side event um, about some of the policies that affect um, migration of healthcare workers and global health. Um, so the, it is a very useful platform and the specific African one I'm not aware of. Okay, thanks Stacey. Just conscious of time, we've got, we've got quite a few questions coming in. Um, there's one for, um, one for Dr. Campbell here. Um, so uh, it's from uh, Mary Irene Ibeto and she asks, what sort of preparation do you think UK doctors going out to rural South Africa should have? Thanks. Um, before we travelled, we did a three-month course in the UK, which certainly wasn't a requirement, but was hugely useful, if only to network with other people who 
were doing similar things really and who were taking time out of training in the NHS. Um, but apart from that, I did almost no other preparation. And I think that's why it took us probably quite several weeks, if not months, to settle and why we found our 15 months working there only just adequate as a length of placement. And I think that reflects on the stage of our career we went out at as well. Thanks, Robin. And um, Mary Irene also has a, a similar question for, for Stacey. And I'm afraid we, we Bill is offline, um, but maybe Stacey can reply. Um, she, also, she also asks, what does um, preparation for UK doctors going to African countries currently look like? And she's also um, she's interested to learning more on the mentoring component of um, HP and GHE initiatives. Wonderful. Well, it's a very loaded question. Lots of things in there. I'm happy for um, Mary Irene to contact me separately. But um, basically, at the moment, um, if we're talking about the global health exchange scheme specifically, there's lots of preparation talks um, and and moments to gather with previous alumni who've been out to learn from their experience. Um, knowing that a lot of doctors who come out to Africa do, do a tropical medicine course before they arrive, we are working on a tropical not a tropical medicine, but sort of a rural health diploma that doctors can do before their placement to help with their level of preparedness. Um, what does the process look like to come work in Africa? It depends from country to country. There are regulatory checks that are required obtaining the right position, but what AHP tries to do is guide you through that process, keeping you informed about what you need and what next steps you need to take. Thanks, Stacey. Um, Kerry, I'll come back to your additional comment at the end, but um, I'm just going to read out a question um, from uh, Chris Bumstead. Um, as, uh, um, you mentioned some practical issues. So, um, uh, what is the experience of enabling people to be released from their work to undertake long term placements? Um, he also asks, what about visas for more than three months? are volunteering operating under employment visas? And finally, um, what preparation do your volunteers have in terms of learning local languages? So there's um, three questions in one, really. There's um, enabling people to be released from their work for, for, for long-term placements, um, the visa issue, whether they're operating under employment visas, and finally, the, um, the learning local language uh, in terms of the preparation. So, so the, I, can, I yeah. can speak to question two and three. Um, I, I can just probably comment on question one, uh, where partnerships like the Global Health Exchange allow see the value and benefit for the scheme as well as for the doctor and so they allow for the out of program year um, but on question two there are different um, regulations around visas for South Africa depending on what kind of activity you've been engaging here we support you to get the right visa so if you were working it would be a work visa um, if you were volunteering, there are lo long-term visa uh, options for volunteering. And in terms of language preparation, as Robin would know, our country has a lot of official languages, so it depends on where you are placed. There is some support that we give as part of our orientation, and also there are e-learning platforms to learn languages. Um, but it is something that we would like to develop further as well. Could I come in there, Sophie? Hello? Yes, Louise, we can hear you. Oh, I could, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think... 
they're very contextual questions, aren't they? So I think on the release thing, what we found, and I think um, Fett are very aware of, is that it depends on the cadre of staff, and it very much depends on the local deaneries and the local hospitals. Um, some are much more supportive than others, but as a project, we will we'll write letters and communicate with people if that helps. Visas, I think, it, again, it's very contextually dependent. I mean, in Uganda, the we have now a system where we get free work permits for all the volunteers, um, and it's absolutely essential that they do have work permits and also clinical registration. I think on the language issue, I mean, in Uganda, the main working language amongst health professionals is English, um, but that doesn't stop communication problems, and many poorer patients don't speak English. Um, we do have a Rotoro translation of things, but I think this really takes me back to the co-presence principle as well, is that we don't allow any of our um, volunteers to, to work on their own with patients, so uh, there would always be co-working with, with local staff. Um, Pete, do you have anything else to add? The yeah, the pediatricians that we recruit, uh, they I'd say probably seventy five percent of them are trainees, so they apply for out of program experience from their deaneries, um, and as long as they give the deaneries enough notice, it um, the UPs tend to be granted. We've also started to recruit nurses to our programs as well, and. Um, We've been really pleasantly surprised how much interest there is from nurses uh, to get involved with our programs. And again, as long as enough time is given, then it seems like they, you know, they're able to take time away from their work to get involved for six, twelve months. Um, in terms of the immigration, kind of similar, uh, similar response that all, all of our doctors and nurses get registered with the, with the local medical councils or nursing councils, obtain the work permits and special passes and, and, um, and whatever else is needed. Um, and in terms of language, um, all of the, well, the countries where we work, um, um, English is the, 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 the language of training. So obviously a lot of what of our volunteers do is lots of teaching and training and so on, and that is done in English. Um, and then, if they're working in uh, on the wars, in the, uh, then the translation is often done by a local uh, counterpart that they're working alongside. Thanks, Pete. And um, Robin, um, 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 you did mention learning a, a local language when you were out in South Africa. I think um, I don't know if you have any personal insights in terms of um, what in relation to the questions that Chris asks around um, getting permission to. Well, it's different, I guess, because it's um, paid placements, but going out there um, and also kind of any preparation you received and um, also learning the language once you were there. Yeah, I mean, I took time out uh, between NHS contracts. We didn't require to apply for an out of program experience. Um, and certainly in terms of languages, um, it, it was hard to prepare in the UK for uh, learning one of South Africa's 11 languages. Once we got there, um, we had a dictionary and uh, and we just learnt um, conversational uh, by um, chatting to staff. Um, and again, the language of the hospital is generally English. Um, but And we generally always needed um, uh, a, a local um, colleague to assist us with any translation that was required. Um, South Africa is challenging because uh, everyone speaks a different language, so people are used to um, translating between different things and even if we tried we would have really struggled within the time we had to get anywhere more than just greetings really and simple medical language. Okay, thank you very much, Robin. I think um, we've, we've gone a bit over time, actually. I'm conscious there might be just a few comments and questions we've not been able to get to, but um, I can send these to the presenters by email afterwards, um, as well as I think there was some follow-up uh, needed for some of the questions. Um, so just wanted to 
uh, thank uh, everyone who registered and attended uh, um, joining our webinar today. We hope that it's been of interest and it's been it's been helpful for you. And of course, um, thank you very much to our presenters who have um, all made some very insightful and detailed presentations today into uh, the contributions of long-term volunteering and placements. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, bye for now. Goodbye. Thank you.